You're listening to Diasport Music on Black Power 96 with Norman Richmond and Melinda Francis, a.k.a. Jalali and uh, Molly Daki Vexen. Joining us on the line is Dr. Uh, Gerald Horn. Dr. Gerald Horn is a prolific author, and uh, he is his current book, book is on uh, the... Give me the correct pronunciation of your new book, Dr. Horn. The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas, Slavery, and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Uh, George Jackson talked about fascism being here in the, in, in the 70s. Now, I don't know who was talking about uh, on the ground in the United States, or or he was talking about himself being under uh, under under so much pressure because you know George had was a teenager had been he, he he spent very little time on the uh, on the outside and this is Black August and you know his 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 death occurred in August his brother's death occurred in August so I just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I just finished uh, reading again his two books, Soledad Brother and Blood in My Eye. And he, of course, grew up in Pasadena, California, in the Los Angeles area, was a field marshal for the Black Panther Party. I think in retrospect that George Jackson, when he was writing about fascism, may have overstated the case for the late 1960s and early 1970s. In fact, as I'm going to tell the story in my book on the Panthers, that was a very unique period uh, because the United States was trying to move away from U.S. apartheid and move towards what we have today. And there were many bumps along the road, of course, scores, if not hundreds of Panthers were killed as a result, which I guess is what helped to drive him to his conclusion. But one of the things that I find striking as I read this this Panther literature uh, is a couple of things. Uh, One, nobody really did an analysis of the forces on the ground in the United States. I mean, the analysis was basically the United States is a racist, reactionary, imperialist country, which is true, and that they could sort of shoot them out of power, which did not turn out to be the case. And in that regard, I've just read the new biography of Eldridge Cleaver, also of Los Angeles, also a Panther leader. And I, I must say, I, I, I've had a rather sour opinion of your fellow Angelino for some time now. And that opinion was solidified after reading this book, because despite his contributions in terms of setting up the international section of the Panther Party in Algeria, uh, helping to move many Panthers in prison towards internationalism and towards the Panthers, uh, his he was actually a very good writer, by the way. But on the other side of the ledger, he was a confessed rapist. He was a thief. He admitted to being a wife beater. In fact, I felt sorry for poor Kathleen Cleaver because Eldridge, despite being a homophobe, was also crossing the line, the gender line, sexually, and of course, certainly heterosexually, even after he was married. And yet, in Algeria, when a disgusted Kathleen Cleaver, his spouse, had an affair with a fellow black American, elders killed him, <laughs> I mean, and buried him and left him for dead in, in North Africa. And then, of course, after he makes his peace with U.S. imperialism, he comes back to the United States. He becomes a born-again Christian. He joins the Mormon, the Church of Latter-day Saints. He joins the Moonies. He's all over the place. And I have to say, it's rather chilling to think that he had so much influence during this fraught moment in history. 
Yeah, Papa Rage, Eldridge, Eldridge Cleaver. I saw him the first time. Uh, uh, Los Angeles, Bunchy Carter, a place called the Teen Post, and he spoke. And uh, I uh, know a lot of people that know uh, that knew Papa Rage, and uh, he was uh, a lot of people suspected him of being working for the other side. Uh, you know, he and Huey, he 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 and Huey uh, uh, fell out, and he was a real alienated. Even inside the prison, he was he, he alienated a, a lot of prison a lot of people uh, he was known to i think the only people that he really supported maybe were the uh uh at the end of his life i think he never denounced the uh uh north koreans but i mean he, he criticized cuba he criticized algeria he criticized uh everywhere he went except i believe the uh the north koreans and of course his daughter was born in in uh North Korean was it was named by Kim uh, Kim Il Sung's uh, wife gave uh, uh, Eldridge's daughter her, her her gave her name, which I can't recall at at, at, at the moment. Say that again. Juju, and in fact, the guy Eldridge killed in North Africa, he killed him with the AK-47 that Kim Il Sung had gifted him when they were in North Korea. I don't expect that Kim Il Sung expected that weapon to be put to such a use, but there you have it. Uh, you're listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96. Melinda, do you have any questions? Uh, well, um, since we're in that sort of kind of vein, do you want to speak a little bit about the passing of Albert Walk, um, Wood Fox and Bill Russell? Well, yeah, Wood Fox, as you know, served decades in solitary confinement in Angola State Prison, a prison named curiously after the Southwest African nation, where DNA tests would show that many of the inmates had roots in that Southwest African nation. And after emerging from prison a few years ago, he wrote this award-winning memoir. In fact, I'm happy to say that I helped him to get one award that put some money in his pocket for that memoir. And of course, uh, Bill Russell was the leading basketball player, uh, perhaps the most uh, victorious basketball player of all time. I mean, he was responsible for about 11 championships as a player and a coach. Michael Jordan is celebrated and he was responsible for six. LeBron James is celebrated, he was responsible for four. But Russell also was an activist, an anti-Jim Crow activist, and uh, also uh, had holdings in Liberia, West Africa, uh, according to uh, Yoko Babu of the Pan-African Film Festival. And certainly he would be sorely missed, but I wanted to ask Norman a question because we need to talk about this crisis in the Taiwan Straits. And Norman, as a devotee of popular music, I'm sure you recall the tune from Archie Bell and the Drells of Houston, Texas. Uh, do you hey, recall hey, the show down? Yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I mean, don't stop there. Oh, no, but Ricky Bell, uh, Archie Bell's brother, Ricky Bell, uh, you talk about Lo South Los Angeles, his, the, 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 Stadium is named after Ricky Bell. He went to school at John C. Fremont, a school which I went to until I got kicked out. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, he was uh, uh, was that song? Hey, hey, gonna be a showdown, gonna be a showdown. It was, it was, it was. Uh, I think it was a Kenny Gamble and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Luke Mann. I think Kenny Gamble and uh, uh, Leon. Huff, it, it was on their label. And uh, Archie Bell was very close to uh, uh, Omawali K. Singh, who was the uh, uh, Chairman O'Malley's right hand man, right hand person. And he 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 actually got me an interview with uh, with, 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 with 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 Archie Bell. And uh, I don't know if, if 
I think Ricky Bell is no longer in the land of the living, if I'm not mistaken. I think he is. But like I say, the the, the, the stadium is named after Ricky Bell, John C. Fremont's football stadium. And of course, uh, the school now is, 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 is predominantly Latino. And there's really, there's no sports program for, for the African community in, in Los Angeles, which is a it's a shame because, you know, John C. Fremont, along with Jefferson Manual Arts, were, we were I think we were in the Southern Southeast Conference, I believe. It had been so long ago. But, you know, Fremont was notorious for producing professional baseball players. At one time, they produced more National League baseball or Major League Baseball players than any other high school in the United States. And of course, Richard Stebbins was uh, an Olympic champion, 1964. I think it was in Tokyo. Uh, he ran the third leg on the on the on the on the 400 relay, four by four relay, and ran the third leg and passed the baton to Bob Hayes, and they won that 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 uh, well, they won that uh, Olympic medal. And I think Richie Boy, we call him Richie Boy. Richie, uh, he ran in the Olympic. He ran. He, he made the finals in the 200 meters, and I, I think he came in seventh. I think the only person he beat was uh, Livio. I think uh, Livio Barute was a great Italian uh, 200 meter man, and I think Barute had won 1960. I think Barute had took came in first. But yeah, that's that that's that's my story on on that situation. Well, I raised this going to be a showdown because. Fundamentally, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, this crisis between the United States is deadly serious. The United States and China, I should say. Uh, it was sparked by a trip a few days ago by Speaker Nancy Pelosi of the United States Congress, the third ranking official in the United States government. The United States obviously angered China which has been shooting missiles over Taipei for the last few days, including not far distant from Japanese territory, sending them a signal. And they've broken off all communication with the United States, not only military, but climate change, cross-border cooperation on crime and all the rest. And the Russian authorities have offered China assistance to confront the United States and the latest bulletin from Moscow, at least, is that the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea has in turn offered Russia 100,000 troops in case they have to send troops to China. So this is a very serious crisis that, that the United States has stumbled into. I'm not sure if the United States is ready for this crisis. I think I've reported before that of 19 tabletop exercises, war games, featuring the United States confronting China. China has won 19 times. We know as well that China has spent uh, quite significantly on its own military. And you may want to have further insight as to why Speaker Pelosi made this trip. Part of it has to do with her district. She has one of the largest concentrations of Asian Americans of any congressional district in San Francisco, a significant percentage being of Chinese origin. And like the Cuban American community in South Florida, uh, many of them had fled the Chinese revolution of 1949, just like the Cuban Americans had fled the Cuban revolution of 1959. And so one possible ray of sunshine coming out of this gloomy picture is that at the same time this crisis was escalating, the United States chose to resume nuclear negotiations with Iran in Vienna, Austria, because I assume that the United States did not want to face all three, Russia, China, and Iran simultaneously, because we know that Mr. Biden just returned from Israel in Saudi Arabia, where confronting Iran was on the table. So I think that the United States is getting ahead of itself. I think that it may be overestimating its strength, 
And also disconcerting is that there is bipartisan support, as they say in Washington, leading Republicans and leading Democrats, basically supporting Nancy Pelosi, although Mr. Biden supposedly counseled her privately not to go. I guess U.S. imperialism feels that uh, the time to confront China is now, because with every passing day, uh, China's economy is surging ahead. And so I assume that Washington feels that if it waits much longer, then it will not have the opportunity to shift the tides of history, which seem to be leading to this Copernican change whereby for the first time in hundreds of years, not only an Asian nation is sitting at the top of the pyramid, but a nation led by communists, which is an ironic conclusion to the Cold War, which we were told led to the death of communism. Are you listening to Guy Spoke Music on Black Power 96? And how does the FBI raid on the headquarters or, or on the raid raids of the African People's Socialist Party in St. Louis, your birthplace, and St. Well, it got a lot of publicity, at least in left-wing circles. Um, I hope that that has impact. As you know, the Uhuru movement and the African People's Socialist Party were raided, drones, uh, handcuffs, understand battering rams. As a matter of fact, somebody told me that this station was shut down for a while. I mean, is that true? Yeah, for yeah, for, 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 for yeah. It was they raided it for nine hours, so they had they basically were in in the station or the Uru house for like nine. They blocked it off, and yeah, so it was nine hours. Yeah, so I, if people want more detail, they can go to one of my Facebook pages, where I, I gave a number of um, interviews about this controversy, including one on KPFK Los Angeles with uh, Chairman O'Malley. But uh, it's obviously a signal because at the same time that was happening, the Republican right was interviewing, I should say entertaining, uh, Hungarian strongman Viktor Orban in Dallas, Texas. And we all know that the Israeli lobby routinely interferes in U.S. electoral affairs, including defeating progressive Jewish congressmen such as Andy Levin, of, Detroit, of Michigan, which they did the other day. And so the message is that only the right wing can be internationalist. Certainly black people cannot be so audacious as to be internationalist. And I think that this brings me to something that I've been thinking about for a while, which is that if I were to write a history of the Republican right over the last few decades up until today, a possible title would be from conservatism to counter-revolution because the Republicans are on the road to counter-revolution. By that meaning, on the road to neo-fascism. By that meaning, overturning legal and constitutional niceties and implanting themselves in power indefinitely. That was certainly the import of January 6, 2021, which we now know may have implicated not only the U.S. Secret Service, the bodyguards of high-level officials, but also leaders of the U.S. military. Both organizations, the Secret Service and the military, have been accused credibly of deleting and scraping text messages from their devices so that evidence would not be around to indict them. So. The question I have for many is how can there be people who still bleat and bray about this noble democratic experiment that was launched in 1776 and of course have tried to give yours truly a beat down in the process for contradicting that happy talk. How can they continue with that line when A, we may be on the verge of fascism, and B, the Republican right does not 
intend for there to be any democratic elections from this point forward. Good point, as they say, point well taken. Had you finished, sir? Go right ahead. Before we move into another topic, I just wanted to shout out um, listeners who were listening to our 2.30 plot and listening to um, Around the Raid in St. Pete specifically. We want to shout out, um, you know, listeners um, who right away came and do- donated. Uh, Malik in Detroit um, for your donation. Um, and also um, Vera in New York. So um, thank you. And, and yeah, keep donating. So have don- uh, donations I, I, gone up since the raid? Pardon? Have donations increased since the raid? Um, well, I think that's the call now because um, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of damage through the raids and specifically in the, the radio station. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think that's a call to to, to, to um, support the station and like doing those repairs and everything. So, um, yeah, so shout out to those two listeners. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. In terms of, uh, can we talk about the, the Kenyan elections? Now, Kenya has been a very important spot for African people, not only in North America, but in the Caribbean. You know, uh, Jomo Kenyatta's, I was, was it, uh, facing Mount Kenya and uh, uh, Ogingo Odinga's, uh, uh, not yet Uhuru. You know, I think I've I've heard Bobby Seal talk about that, and Mumia Abu Jamal, Angela Davis. A lot of people talk about how the the impact that those books had on them. And I remember there is a brother that's still in the land of the living, named Mina Kenyatti. He wrote a lot of books on Mau Mau, and he taught Swahili in, in in at the Detroit uh, Public Library still in the land of the living election. Well, you know, I wrote this book a few years ago on the U.S. and the liberation of Kenya, Mau Mau in Harlem, with a question mark. That phrase, of course, comes from Malcolm X, who paid careful and close attention to the revolt leading to independence in 1963. And what's interesting is that in 1963, two of the leading politicians were Kenyatta and Odenga. In 2022, two of the leading politicians are Kenyatta and Odinga. Now, of course, it's not, <laughs> not the same person, the same. right? but they're offspring. And what's interesting is that Uhuru Kenyatta uh, is the outgoing president, term limited, and he was supposed to turn over power to his deputy, William Ruto, instead of his longtime antagonist. Uh, Ryla Odinga, because we know that those families have been crossing swords for decades. Uh, Odinga, the Karen Odinga, has run for president four times. It's the fifth time without winning. And somehow they cut a deal. Now, I'm not sure what was behind the deal. Uh, If it has been reported, it has escaped my attention. But in any case, according to polls, Odinga is ahead, given the deal he cut with Kenyatta. Ruto is supposedly behind, but he's running a sort of populist campaign. I don't mean that as an insult either, in the sense that he's saying that he's a hustler, that uh, he started out poor. You know, he sounds like your your homeboy Drake. Started at the bottom, but look at me now. Mm -hmm. But um, whereas Odinga and Kenyatta, of course, to an extent, were born with silver spoons in their mouth. Now, whether or not that'll work is questionable because Mr. Ruto now is one of the richest men in Africa. So he, he was really <laughs> awesome. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, in 2007, recall, there was significant violence uh, with the Kenyan elections. We don't expect the same on Tuesday when these elections take place, but we have to be careful. Uh, Kenya, of course, has significant regional impact, not only in Ethiopia and Somalia and Uganda, and of course in the East African community, which it spearheads. 
but also in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So we have to pay very careful and close attention to this election unfolding. I just want to say one thing, then I want to turn it over to Melinda. I, we had a comrade uh, that used to work with us at uh, on the radio, uh, Anyango Olo, who was, uh, he passed away in the last couple of years, but he uh, he was in prison with uh, in, in Kenya. And uh, he was a great comrade of ours at uh, CKLN. Did you ever talk to Olo at any time? Of course, he, he, he's no longer living. Uh, no, Anyango uh, Olo passed away in the last two years, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, Melinda, you have a question? Um, I um, do. We want to talk about Griner and the prosecution. Yeah, it doesn't look good for the six foot nine inch basketball star who was arrested in February. 2022 at the Moscow airport with some sort of cannabis oil in her bags, which is not kosher in Russia. She says it was for pain relief. Apparently many basketball players seeking to avoid opioids use cannabis oil for pain alleviation. Russia, the court was not hearing it. They sentenced her to nine years, not in a prison, but in a penal colony in the far reaches of Siberia, which means it will be difficult for her to get visitors. I think, and I trust this is just a prelude to negotiations for a prisoner swap, whereby Brittany Greiner and perhaps another US national will, coming back, will be coming back to the United States and Victor Boot, a notorious arms dealer, uh, performed his role, performed by Nicolas Cage in a movie, Lords of War, will be released from a US prison in return. But we shall see because relations between the United States and Russia have hit rock bottom. I mean, it's, it's quite serious, quite significant. And uh, unfortunately, this was not a good time to be arrested in Russia if you carry a blue US passport. And Dr. Horn, I think this is the last question, but could you talk about, uh, give us some more information on your uh, preliminary research on uh, Egypt and Ethiopia, the, 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 the volume that you're writing about that? Yeah, uh, so it's mostly going to deal with the 19th century after the U.S. Civil War. I think I might have said this before, but don't worry, I'll, I'll provide new detail. After the U.S. Civil War, the losing side, the slave owners, they started sending their comrades to Egypt. And they were going to try to perpetuate a conquest of Ethiopia. And what's interesting about that is that Egypt had ambitious plans to be a kind of sub-imperial power. Uh, that is to say that already Egypt, Cairo had a major slave market uh, in any case, even before their arrival, uh, with the enslaved coming, of course, heavily from Sudan, but also as far south as what is now Tanzania and what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so what's interesting is that uh, they were ultimately not successful. But even before that, one of the, my more recent revelations, uh, which sheds light upon the uh, abolishing of slavery in the United States, is that in the 1820s, Egypt was critical to Ottoman Turkey's plan to hold on to Greece. Greece was an appendage of Muslim Ottoman Turkey, Greece being predominantly Christian. And what was interesting is that the, the Egyptian military were crossing the sea into Greece and enslaving Greeks and shipping them to slave markets in both Turkey and Egypt. And this was infuriating uh, people in the United States, particularly the Euro-Americans. Uh, although, of course, black Americans like David Walker, you're probably familiar with David Walker's appeal. He mentions this episode in his notorious appeal of 1829. Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper, they talk about this, but they, they see it as hypocritical 
that these Euro-Americans are so upset about enslaving Greeks, but have some of them have nothing to say about enslaving Africans in North America. But what I will maintain when I sit down to write is that the prospect of Egypt, Africans, because many of these soldiers were Sudanese, you know, uh, the people darker than blue. And so the prospect of these Sudanese soldiers enslaving Greek maidens was infuriating people in the United States and helps to give a jolt to the abolition of slavery movement because there was a fear that the tables would be turned, which was a legitimate fear because if you go back to the beginning of the 19th century in North Africa, you had uh, the Algerians, the Tunisians, and what we would call today the Libyans uh, enslaving uh, hundreds of Euro-Americans. You, you know about the um, the marine hymn from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Uh, that, yes, sir. that was reflective of that trend. And also one of my sidelights is that the U.S. was charging, and I'm just telling you, I'm just repeating what they were charging. The U.S. was charging the Jewish merchants in Algiers, Tunis particularly, were helping to spearhead this enslaving of Euro-American soldiers, and I'm going to have to tease out what impact that has on Jewish Americans in North America. So that's it. And uh, you mentioned the, the newspaper. We, I guess we should remember uh, Mary Ann Shad was a great, uh, uh, born in the United States, but she came to, I guess, Windsor and put out uh, a publication, uh, news, one of the first black newspapers in, uh, in, 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 in Canada. Have you done, uh, you haven't done any, any major thing on Mary Ann Shad, have you? She's in my book, Negro Comrades of the Crown. Check it out. Came out about 10 years ago. I have that. I don't remember. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and check that out. Um, did you do, is it a, a lot of, a, a, quite a bit, bit of coverage or, or just a, a footnote type? All of the above. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to answer? Time to sign off. Anything, Melinda? No, we'll see everybody in the whirlwind next week. All right, time for some John William Coltrane. Take care. <laughs>